This lecture takes a comprehensive look at the September-October LD resolution that members of the World Trade Organization ought to reduce intellectual property protections for medicine. I say a comprehensive look because it's going to examine uh, most of the arguments that are being made on the topic as opposed to the novice lecture I gave, which just kind of covered a few of the arguments. So as normal, we'll start with just some basic understanding of terms. Uh, the first is the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization is an organization um, that was established to kind of just basically establish some rules and norms for when countries uh, trade with one another. Because, you know, without any rules, countries uh, can put tariffs on, which make it difficult uh, for, a, you know, a country to sell goods in another country, or they could just impose laws and regulations that inhibit that trade. So the idea was it would create a multilateral or meaning uh, involving many countries uh, trade organization to try to establish some rules, some norms, and some expectations. As the resolution says, it is the member station, member nations of the World Trade Organization that are supposed to take this action to reduce um, intellectual property. Well, who are those member nations? It's really almost every uh, nation in the world. So the resolution imagines that almost every nation in the world would act. And the other thing I want to point out that's related to that is that the resolution imagines that the individual member nations act. It doesn't even say that or require or even really suggest at all that these member nations like have to have, uh, form some agreement through the World Trade Organization, right? So um, earlier in the spring, we saw, you know, President Biden push for a waiver on, uh, of intellectual property waiver uh, on on these uh, on COVID nineteen drugs, and all the other countries did not agree. Uh, many of them did not. But th th this resolution doesn't imagine that type of process. It just imagines that uh, the member nations of the World Trade Organization kind of uh, individually, essentially, uh, agree to. Uh, agree to do that. Just as if you said the members of the debate team would do something, that doesn't mean that all the, all the, all, you know, there has to be some process uh, at a debate meeting for that to occur. It's just identifying, in that case, identifying the students, the subset of students within the school. In this case, it's identifying a subset of countries in the world that just happens to be almost every single country. Well, what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is a category of property that includes kind of the intangible, I think this says it well, intangible creations of the human intellect. So we normally think of property as something we own, like this computer I'm using to record this lecture or the cell phone that is sitting next to me. But the intellectual property is kind of the uh, things that I might create or other people create through their uh, intellect, or in some cases, a collective intellect, if it's a company, right? So an author may, may create a book that's an individual product, or you might have a whole company or organization create a drug. Uh, there are four basic types of intellectual property. We're primarily concerned with two of them, and, re and really one uh, primarily even, I guess I would say, uh, to a greater degree that a lot of the literature is talking about, a patent. A patent is a type of intellectual property that gives its owner the legal right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention, right? So we're going to say that COVID-19 drugs, other types of drugs, are actually inventions and that people can't just kind of take, once you kind of make your effort into creating that invention, that other people can't just take it, just take your invention uh, and, and, and use your invention and sell it, and sell it themselves. Under the World Trade Organization, which includes protections for intellectual property rights, uh, that patent protection lasts for 20 years. Trade secrets are types of intellectual property that comprise formulas, practices, processes, designs. So it's kind of a little, I mean, you, you might just think of it a little more detail, but it is a little bit different than the actual, um, the, the actual patents itself, okay? Then we have a trademark. So, you know, I'm sure Pfizer has a trademark uh, different, you know, sports teams have trademarks and then copyright, right? So like I said earlier, if I, if I write a book, then I own the copyright on that. Now, intellectual property related to medicines does deal with all of these, right? You can't just take something and sell it. I can't just take something and sell it under Pfizer's name uh, using their logos. That would be a violation of their trademark or maybe an instruction manual that they produce. But we're primarily, like I said, talking about patents. That's really what most of the literature will talk about. Some ads in trade secrets in there. 
is some incidental trademark and copyright uh, that's related. Now, what does this have to do with the World Trade Organization? Well, as I said, kind of the idea, like basically the, the reason people came up with this, this topic, probably when they had the topic meeting and decided these things, was at the time back in the spring, right, there was Biden was pushing the World Trade Organization to all agree to have a waiver on COVID-19 uh, drugs. So that's what the World Trade Organization, um, uh, you know, that, that's kind of why this topic probably says the member nations of the World Trade Organization. The wording is just a little, like I say, imprecise because it doesn't, it does, they don't have to act as individuals. Uh, but the World Trade Organization has something called the Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, TRIPS, which you'll see mentioned in the debate in a lot of the literature. And under TRIPS, generally, uh, intellectual property rights protection applies to medicine, which kind of like I say, leads us to the current controversy, right? Why this controversy came up. So intellectual property applies to medicine. You have your major drug manufacturers like Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, they all own patents on really the best vaccines. Of course, China has its own vaccine. So does Russia. They have patents on their own drugs. Most people say that these vaccines are not as um, effective as the, the Pfizer and the, and the Moderna and the Moderna vaccines, like the China and the Russia vaccines only around 60%. The other ones are like 85% plus and even higher on reducing hospitalizations. But anyhow, um, you know, so we have these companies have patents on these drugs that they developed. Uh, interesting, of course, with the cooperation of their governments, but nonetheless, they have patents on them. And so other people just kind of can't take them and use them and reproduce them. Of course, COVID-19 drugs are not the only issue. Um, you know, there's, there's other drugs, there's HIV AIDS drugs, there's people who need just kind of access, um, you know, to certain shots and other kind of drugs. So there are other drugs that, you know, come up in this debate. Um, obviously, like I said, a lot of the literature, the recent literature is being written about COVID-19, but a lot of it comes up elsewhere. Again, U.S. policy, this is, you know, the topic's relevant to everyone in the world, but the U.S. has generally supported the waivers. Uh, but other prominent countries, uh, many European countries, Japan, has, have been opposed to these waivers. Uh, the waiver idea was originally introduced by India and South Africa, of course, wanted access to the drugs. Now, the resolution, um, you know, as we'll discuss, there are other ways you could reduce uh, intellectual property. You, you could waive intellectual property. You could limit a, a limited intellectual property rights claim to a certain number of years or just a certain way a drug is articulated. But... Um, you can or defined, I guess I should say, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but uh, generally, you know, most people are just kind of saying reduce intellectual property rights for, for, uh, protections for drugs, or they're saying use the waiver or something that we'll talk about a little bit more called one and done, which is also uh, somewhat uh, popular. So of course there, you know, as we move into Lincoln Douglas debate, um, you know, the resolution kind of really says all, it doesn't say all, I should say, but, it, you know, it says like member nations of the World Trade Organization. So, you know, of course, in LD, there's there's a controversy about whether or not the affirmative that kind of essentially would have to defend like all countries reducing, um, uh, all, all countries reducing this or, uh, you know, at least the majority of countries or whether or not they could pick our particular country. If you look at the arguments that have been run so far, most people are kind of generally, uh, you know, kind of defending basically that all countries are going to do this, which, you know, of course makes some sense. Like I say, almost every country in the world is a member of the, uh, the World Trade Organization. So if you just had like a thing where somebody could pick one country and like, you know, uh, just, you know, argue for one drug, <laughs> reducing intellectual property rights protection on one drug, so I'll talk about in a second, that would, you know, be a very uh, broad topic. And also it's kind of like, you know, all, all or nearly all medicine. So most people are defending that intellectual property uh, rights protections would be reduced on kind of all medicines across the board. Though their cases usually end up being about COVID. But there are some people who are just uh, talking about cannabis or, you know, what you might call like medical marijuana, why it's bad to have intellectual property rights protections on that. And there's also a couple of people talking just about reducing intellectual property rights on gene editing um, in order to kind of uh, increase the amount of gene editing that occurs. So there are a few specific uh, drugs uh, cases. Um, all or nearly all reductions. As I mentioned, most people are talking about the waiver. 
uh, just allowing a waiver for like a, a COVID-19 drug. Some people kind of go broader and say you should have a waiver for like all intellectual property. Um, other people kind of like kind of have like a little bit of more of a middle road. Um, they're arguing for this one and done proposal. Basically, what comp a lot of companies do is they'll say, OK, well, we have a patent on this drug. Patent lasts for a certain period of time, but let's kind of like modify the drug in a particular way. Let's like add in a little bit, right? A, right? Modify the drug in a particular way. We could say it's a new drug that would extend the patent. We could say like, oh, we're now, now this drug also uses this other like processes that's like a protected as a trade secret or a patent. So now that's like a new thing. And, and that patent lasts for like another seven years beyond this. So companies find like kind of creative ways essentially to extend their patents. It's called evergreening. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, and it's a very common kind of pro argument. Um, so the art, the, you know, so what they say, people say is you should, you just essentially eliminate, eliminate it or limit it, I should say, to the original instantiation of kind of the drug and the patent that's as long as it lasts. Um, you could also have like compulsory licensing, which I'm surprised more people haven't argued about, but it wouldn't be all countries, but you know, the developing world countries, like basically what they could do is they could kind of illegally copy the drug. They could basically like reverse engineer it, compulsory license it, like force the licensing and give the drug away, which could be uh, argue, you know, arguably a counter plan um, as well. But the, that's actually a way of reducing um, intellectual property rights protection. Of course, then, you know, in LD, we have values, you know, there, we have particular values, you know, utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, which I would, I think is what most people are arguing for on both sides. There's arguments related to moral obligations, which I'm a little surprised we haven't seen more of, of just kind of the moral obligation to give away these drugs. Uh, there are contrasting kind of moral claims about property rights, like you should be able to take my property and give it away to other people. But then of course, some people say that economic resources, you know, kind of terms of distributed justice um, should kind of be made available to uh, everybody. So there's a couple of couple of some of the broad issues there that we've discussed, but now I want to look at um, some details of, uh, you know, some, or I should say some more particular specific affirmative arguments. As I said, like, you know, the, the basic one is that, look, we need to distribute these drugs um, or the people are going to die that, you know, most of the drugs um, I've seen stuff, uh, statistics that say, you know, 90, anywhere between 90 and 98% of the vaccines that have been administered have been administered in the developed world, um, not in the developing world, and that people need access to COVID vaccines. And some people kind of just say a lot of people die from COVID. Other people say it's going to create a lot of like long-term um, kind of instability in countries and kind of prevent their economies from recovering. And of course, if the rest of the world doesn't recover, um, then the developed world is going to be dragged down with it to a degree. Um, some people talk about AIDS drugs and the need for people to access AIDS drugs, uh, tuberculosis drugs, all different types of drugs that you could have kind of particular arguments on. But there's this basic idea that uh, people in developing countries need to be able to access these drugs um, and they need to be able to, of course, you know, they can get, they could they could buy them. But the, the reality is that they can't afford them at the current prices that are being sold. So if you reduce the intellectual property, then more people would be able to access these drugs they could be reproduced at much lower costs in these other countries now there's also a related argument that people are making that like hey if you don't um if, if you don't try to control the the spread of covid in particular um in, even in the developing world just the more people worldwide that get covid and the longer it stays in their body the greater risk of a mutation that could overwhelm the the, the vaccines that we have, like causing a lot of difficulties and problems. Um, other people say that there are future risks of bioterrorism and biological, um, biological weapons, and we need to allow more innovation. And I'll talk about innovation, right? Like when the companies kind of hoard some of the intellectual property that they have, it makes it hard for other countries to innovate, um, which turns kind of the most common negative argument. There are courses I just mentioned earlier, you can make arguments about morality and the need on the appropriateness of distributing the drugs. Um, some people say that this is important for the credibility of the World Trade Organization um, to have this waiver. Like I say, it does get a little tricky because it, the, the resolution doesn't really kind of require or really necessarily assume, maybe it implies, but I don't even know if it does that, um, uh, that the World Trade Organization Act, it just seems to me that all these countries would kind of act independently uh, and decide on their own. Now, arguably, I think a pro could say that that would help the 
the credibility of the World Trade Organization since this was originally proposed through the WTO. I mean, the con might say like, well, hey, all these countries, these member nations just decided to do it on their own. So there's really no reason why that would increase the credibility of the WTO anyhow. You can make a general argument. Like I said, there, you know, there's a lot of different drugs. There's, you know, just arguments about access. There was a previous public forum topic that was somewhat similar to this, um, where, the, where the pro had to de defend price controls on drugs, right? That companies could only, um, could, companies could only charge so much for drugs, which actually on this topic could kind of be a, a counter plan, um, right? To not share the intellectual property, but to really limit the price that the drugs um, the drugs are sold uh, for um, because there's a lot of, you know, this was debated really as a, a U.S. more domestic topic, but there's just kind of a lot of evidence that says people can't afford their drugs, that the, the drugs, the drug prices are too high and like we need to reduce them. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. We talk about counterplan. Um, there's also, arguments, excuse me, about racism, how minorities, especially blacks and Hispanics, like can't get access to these drugs. Um, and then intellectual property really is something really kind of protects essentially, you know, basically like white privilege because, if, you know, the, these companies, um, you know, the, the people who kind of uh, control these companies who control uh, who control the patents are all kind of tend to be uh, white and wealthy. And of course, intellectual you know, property uh, gets passed on from one generation to the next. Um, and even as you see kind of more. Uh, blacks and Hispanics become part of these companies. They're not part of the leadership infrastructure yet. For, for the most part, they don't have access um, to all of the um, intellectual property. They don't inherit it. Um, so you can make a number of arguments there about uh, racism. Um, a couple teams, a couple debaters, I should say, are arguing biopiracy. Biopiracy is the idea that you go into developing countries, you find some kind of unique a thing maybe like in a plant, you know, some kind of environmental thing like and then you basically take that you discover that sequence uh, that gene sequence basically or it could be a gene sequence or just some other medicinal product and you patent it. Um, and then you take it and you sell it and you're selling it generally <laughs> at prices that are much higher than they can afford. Um, so you're basically kind of taking like what is essentially the, the property that's in their area. Uh, you're coming in as a large company and you're patenting that knowledge um, and then they cannot uh, gain access to it. And it is kind of, an, you know, that is an important part of drug development. Um, some people are just arguing just kind of more straight up that capitalism is bad, that patents really protect what you would call a form of monopoly capitalism, right? They give a company monopoly control um, over, over uh, a medicine or a set of medicines, which really, you know, you can debate about capitalism, good or bad, but monopoly capitalism um, can it's arguably particularly bad because monopoly capitalism eliminates even the potential benefits of capitalism, right? So it eliminates uh, market competition. Um, it makes things inefficient. It may discourage people from innovating because they already have like, you know, uh, the product that they need. Uh, they can control it. They don't need to worry about competitors developing the product. Um, so I think you could also kind of make some specific arguments about monopoly capitalism is bad. Um, some affirmative teams are arguing whether like Chinese soft power is good or bad. Well, what does that have to do with the topic? Well, China has a Sinovac vaccine that they, you can debate like how much they are or aren't distributing this to the world. Um, but uh, the argument is, is that right now, like China has a, a lead um, and is gaining global influence by distributing Sinovac. But at the countries of the world now, these are particularly the United States because we kind of obviously own and control most of the other vaccines. If we were to give them away, this would allow us to kind of chite or excuse me, fight like China, China's influence in the world. Uh, and we can argue that U.S. influence and U.S. hegemony is better than Chinese influence. Uh, similarly, some people argue that um, well, you know, they argue the opposite, right? They say that, hey, if we reduce intellectual property on these drugs, China was make like China really look good too, and it could increase their influence. So, you know, there's link, link, turn on either side, but those are those basic arguments. Um, uh, the WTO credibility argument I already talked about. And then we should also mention, so innovation. So innovation is kind of the, the core debate on the topic, right? So the con, the major con, the, the major, the kind of the best, I would say, the, the, the most uh, 
Uh, conventional con argument is that if you have these companies get, you know, if you make these companies give up their intellectual property, then other people aren't going to invest in the companies anymore because they're going to think that like they're not going to be able to make profits on their drugs. I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about the con, but you know, they're pro kind of essentially their link turns to that. Um, they say that, you know, some people say that patents block innovation. As I already mentioned, you can't, if you're a second company, you can't kind of innovate on what the first company did necessarily that some countries don't want to innovate because they, they fear that like they're going to be sued, right? They're the other company that will claim that they're, they're, there's some relevant part of their patent. And then there's this idea of evergreen, which is a super uh, common affirmative uh, argument that we have a lot of blocks available to now. But the, the evergreening argument is the idea that you can kind of extend life forever. It's evergreen, right? It doesn't die. Uh, basically, the claim is, is that what companies do is they get this, like I said, they get this original patent on a drug, and then they just kind of keep making small alterations, and that small alteration allows them to have a new patent, right? And then uh, they just kind of essentially keep extending uh, the life of the patent, right? And then their ownership of the drug, right? So they can they can have a small innovation, or like I say, they could add in some additional small process that involves kind of some new uh, intellectual property and extend it forever. So there are a good number, given the centrality of this argument to the negative, there are a good number of affirmative teams that just start this argument in the debate, right, on the, on the affirmative. And they just say, hey, look, in the status quo, there's not enough innovation. Innovation is being blocked by like patents, monopolies, fear of lawsuits. Pretty much everybody says evergreening, okay? And that um, the only way to have more innovation is to get rid of the intellectual property. So there's obviously kind of this debate about the link. Um, and, you know, it, it is, you know, well, <laughs> there may be some truth to all these arguments. It's unclear to me how much innovation kind of would occur if we didn't have any intellectual property rights protection at all. Why would there be investors? We can talk more about that later, but it's a very common affirmative arguments. And look, even if affirmatives don't make the arguments in the AC, you're going to have to make them <laughs> AR when the, the con team almost in every debate reads the disadvantage and they're probably reading them in the AC because even if they, you know, maybe if these arguments aren't, you know, net link turns, like there's just not a lot of time to read them in the AR uh, and cover everything else. I also kind of wanted to mention that, you know, some teams, like I said, they're just arguing. Um, so one thing, they're, one thing, uh, particular drug that, drug that teams are arguing for reducing uh, intellectual property rights are on is cannabis. So negative. So the major negative argument, the core topic argument is innovation. Um, as I kind of just kind of said briefly, the basic idea behind this argument is really kind of simple. The argument is, is that if, if, if uh, companies can't get their intellectual property protected, then nobody's going to invest in these, com these companies uh, in their drug development and, nobody, and the companies themselves are not going to invest in drug development. And drug development, you know, it's worth noting, is really expensive. It costs billions and billions of dollars to develop drugs. And look, all the, all the drugs that people invest in don't succeed, just like any company, like every product it creates does not necessarily sell, right? So, so you're, you're investing billions of dollars up front, expecting kind of a return on the long term, but not even on every product. So the argument is that just there won't be investors um, or there'll be substantially less investment and drugs won't develop. And then, you know, so that's kind of the core part of the argument, right? The drug development is expensive and requires investors. Without investors, there are not going to be new drugs. And some people outline specific impacts. They'll say, hey, we need new COVID-19 drugs. Like we can't just have, uh, you know, the, there are, there are uh, mutations, right, that we may need some new drugs for. Um, some people just kind of just kind of talk about like, uh, you know, generally about other like pandemic diseases that are going to like come in the future that we don't know exactly what their makeup is yet that we need investors for. Other people talk about like other specific diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer. Uh, some say gene ed editing. Gene ed editing is a new thing. You can look up a technology uh, called CRISPR. Um, I should have mentioned there's actually kind of a case. Um, there's a case about reducing uh, kind of gene editing patents and allowing this technology CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. -S um, this was a public forum topic in China actually a couple of years ago. 
um, it was very timely because some of the first gene editing was done in Hangzhou, China. But there's a whole there's a whole debate about a kind of whether gene editing is good or bad. And I put uh, some of those back files into the into the folder uh, that our subscribers can access. Then there are arguments about like bioterror, as I mentioned earlier, and biodefense that we need to be able to um, kind of innovate to kind of deal with these. And then uh, medical marijuana. Um, in, in, you know, innovation, people say, well, we're not going to be able to innovate, um, right now, right? Like marijuana has become legal in many States. Um, and that there's a, a medical marijuana cannabis industry developing and that if we don't have patents, we're not going to be able to have that investment. So look, everything under B does assume a, right. It assumes that kind of develop drug development is expensive, requires investors, like getting rid of intellectual property kind of chills that that's the link debate that you know I was just discussing previously right so the the affirmative has some arguments as to why these patents reduce innovation the negative has some arguments um, as to why the patents protect innovation and then you have all these impacts which I see some, say sometimes you say are in are in the AC or the NC obviously if the if the if the if the AC reads innovation, uh, impacts, then the, the, the negative is not going to want to present this just simply like as a disadvantage or essentially going to read all their links um, as solvency turns and they're going to want to answer all the arguments such as evergreening and monopolies like, you know, you're going to want to answer those arguments that the affirmative makes and then just kind of basically win that they're winning solvency turns to the advantage. Um, and then similarly, kind of on a related impact, right, some people argue that biotech companies are just really important. Um, to California, and, right, in general. And, you know, there are some kind of related, kind of not quite the same as kind of innovation, but their economy arguments, um, you know, they can kind of get caught up in the strength of the biotech argu companies' arguments, like I say, where you have the California economy, but that are a little bit different that say that it's really good for U.S. companies to make really large profits because it enables them to compete effectively against other countries. And then there's an argument that when we kind of dominate uh, the global pharmaceutical uh, markets, that this allows our dominant, the, the U.S. dollar to be dominant. Um, and is it kind of important to our hegemony? So uh, there's a, I had some extensive files on uh, whether U.S. dollar dominance is good or bad. So those are uh, in there as well. Other people say that, um, that there's kind of basically a chill argument that says that if we waive uh, intellectual property rights for for uh, the pharmaceutical industry, that other industries are going to fear that th there is going to be a waiver uh, for those types of patents. So, you know, obviously Biden is big on like backing uh, efforts to solve climate change. But what if kind of people start to fear, OK, well, all these waivers just went through. And if you think about it, right, the the affirmative is essentially imagining that every country agrees to a waiver. Well, if every country like agrees to a waiver on medicines, maybe they'll agree to waivers on something else, such as like technologies that we need to combat climate change. I mean, that's arguably good, but it also could kind of chill investment in there and kind of cause those types of problems. So it's kind of the perceptions of other industries reacting to this like uh, release of patents on medicines and climate investment is one of that. There are also arguments related to safety and backlash. I mean, the basic argument is that, look, a lot of these uh, or two of these vaccines, OK, Pfizer and Moderna, um, they use mRNA technology, which is a very new technology. Uh, and the argument is, is that if you just release this intellectual property and, and allow other other companies really anywhere in the world to kind of just start manufacturing these drugs, they might not kind of do like a very good job. Um, and they might create like a lot of dangers and they might not be engineered properly and they might not be tested properly. Um, so that's all kind of the, the con the, this concept that that discusses is called biosafety, right? Are these, are these things safe? Well, if they're, if they're not, if they're not engineered properly and they're, they're just kind of given out, um, and they, they cause a lot of problems. And there's, there's some evidence that there, there have been like some instances of this that, what can happen is that, you know, people die. That's bad. Right. Um, and then also there could be like a backlash against these drugs. Like people are just going to see these drugs as dangerous, like anti-vaccine advocates. Right. Are really going to say like, oh, my gosh, look, somebody 
you know, in Africa took the Moderna vaccine and, you know, they, they distributed in the city and like a thousand people died. Well, it may be their, their engineered version of it, um, but nonetheless, it could create kind of, you know, in addition to the death, like the general uh, more anti-vaccine um, movements. Uh, there's a China argument that says that U.S. leadership, um, right now the U.S. leads in biotechnology and controls a lot of the technology, but if we just uh, kind of wave the patents and give it away, China will also gain access to it. Then they can innovate on top of it. You know, first of all, the first link is that they would just kind of offset our lead, right? And the second is they may be able to out-innovate us like once they have, uh, once they have access to like all the products or all the technology then they, they would out innovate us and this would undermine our global hegemony. This is a kind of a common disadvantage. Uh, some people argue the World Trade Organization itself is bad. There are arguments about why free trade is bad, that free trade like leads to kind of abusive labor practices because in other countries, right, we have goods produced in other countries because there aren't like labor agreements uh, that protect workers' rights, that they don't really have strong environmental laws. So when they're producing things, they destroy the environment. Um, and then there's some general arguments about like why multi, like it's actually better to have like kind of regional, like essentially what you might call trade blocks or trade agreements than multilateral trade. Um, that's a little different than the trade good bad debate because obviously you would still have trade under kind of the, under the regional blocks, but you kind of get the, uh, you get that kind of the basic um, idea, right? So the, um, you know, people could say that the World Trade Organization is actually bad. We don't want to boost its credibility. It's on outsourcing just said, this is probably kind of weak. It just says like when the costs rise for companies, then they outsource. Um, they hire basically uh, their labor from other countries. Um, and the argument is that if uh, we start hiring more labor from China and China benefits from outsourcing, then we'll put more tariffs on China and cause a trade war with China. I mean, this is not a great argument. None of the evidence is really... Uh, the, the link evidence even talking about biotech companies, it's like hard to imagine that um, if the U.S. kind of reduces intellectual property rights protection, the companies were a little stretched at what they would just go hire all these uh, scientists in China or India to like innovate their products or to work in like pharma, um, it, you know, in the U.S. and standards, those types of things. It's not really clear that they could hire these people, hiring them themselves or limits to that. You can't just hire like Anyhow, it'd be complicated. It's not about farm. I don't want to go into the details that are our argument, but to just kind of present it. Other people argue that this would reduce foreign investment, that some countries rely on foreign investment in their uh, kind of medical products and their medical technology sector to boost their economy. And without this, the uh, there'll be less foreign investment um, in, in those sectors, and that could hurt their economy. Uh, foreign de foreign direct investment is a good bad is a, a big debate in public forum all the time. It's kind of like one of their core generic arguments. So um, I put some additional evidence on FDI in the uh, in the folder as well. There's kind of a basic de-development argument that just says economic crash is good for anyone on the affirmative. If they say, hey, we strengthen the economy uh, by kind of essentially these innovation turns, people argue it's better to let the economy collapse, uh, destroys the environment. Uh, Modi, Modi credibility bad says that if Modi, who's the, the, the prime minister of India, if actually solved COVID in the country, then Mo, Modi would have more credibility and Modi would be more aggressive. Um, FDI goods already covered that. And then, you know, we have like kind of our value objection of like property rights, um, property rights being good. All right. Counter plans. Uh, there are a lot of different counter plans. Um, you could distribute more drugs through what's called COVAX, which is an, uh, a, I mean, you can think of it as a facility, it's a process, it's, it's a means through which there was a commitment made back in the spring that the developed world would give the developing world more drugs uh, to increase the, the distribution. Now, we haven't really, this really hasn't panned out. Most of the countries have not followed through on their commitments. Um, but obviously, through the counterclaim mechanism, you can say like, "Hey, we'll we'll give out more, um, we'll we'll give out more drugs uh, that allow the, uh, um, you know, uh, we'll just give the developing world more drugs, right?" And then you say it's better to kind of continue uh, to protect our uh, intellectual property rights. Um, you could give that. I've seen a version of this counterplan that says you could give them money to purchase the drugs.
Um, right. So it's like you wouldn't have to give the drugs away, but here's some funds. You can use the money to purchase the drugs from the major vaccine producers. And uh, this means we don't have to give away our drugs. I've seen a version of the counter plan that just has China funded. Uh, just China kind of fund the, the, uh, the you, you know, maybe give away some China vaccines, maybe not like Chinese vaccines are less effective. So some people maybe wouldn't want to give those away, but kind of just have China fund uh, the purchasing of the, uh, the, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines and give them away to the developing world. And they argue this would increase their soft power and it's better for China to do it alone than both together, which is the perm, because otherwise the... Um, Otherwise, uh, China's soft power or the global leadership won't increase. And some people argue that Chinese global leadership is important for stability um, and things of that nature. Chinese hegemony is actually better than U.S. hegemony, people can argue uh, in the debates. Then there is kind of the their issue of kind of price controls. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as a counter plan, you could say, well, you could limit the amount of you can limit the price that the companies can sell the drugs at, right? Um, like I say, in the U.S., this is a huge debate. Some people even argued for this thing called reference pricing, which means that we can't charge people in the United States. Companies can't charge people in the United States more than they charge people in other countries for the drugs. Why do they do this? Because other countries often have price controls that don't allow them to sell this. So it's like, okay, you can only make so much money on this drug. We're not going to force you to give away your intellectual property. We're not going to say you can't make any money on the drug, but we're going to limit the amount of money that you can sell the drug for. And there would probably be some like regional pricing well, in Africa. You can sell it for X, Y, and Z, um, those types of things. Um, there's also, I've seen a counter plan to just abolish the World Trade Organization. Argue free trade is bad, or you could have the countries explicitly withdraw from the World Trade Organization uh, because uh, then they, of course, they would no longer be members. And you could say that the World Trade Organization um, is bad. There's a popular counter plan to consult uh, the World Health Organization um, on the, just argue that and they argue that the World Health Organization would agree to this, but you know, agree to issue the waivers or, you know, or the one and done, you know, the World Health Organization generally supports distributing drugs. So they would probably all be in favor of this. But the idea is, is that this would just the process of consulting the World Health Organization itself would strengthen the world health organization. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of reproduced an essay there on like how to debate uh, consult counter plans. Then there are other kind of just interesting like process counter plans. You could say that uh, one says that the U.S., like basically the World Trade Organization would propose the waiver. The U.S. would refuse it. Uh, and then the World Trade Organization would rule against the United States. Um, and some people argued, well, and then the U.S. would comply. They'd be out compliance, right? So they say the U.S. says no. So the World Trade Organization proposes it. The U.S. says no. The World Trade Organization rules against the United States, and then the U.S. complies. And people argue that this process would really strengthen the World Trade Organization. The second thing they argue is that it's politically uh, more kind of saliable, right? It would actually kind of like Biden would... Biden would be at least seen as challenging the waiver because or whatever the the, re, the relaxation in intellectual property rights is because uh, look and I, I should have talked about this when I talked about disadvantages I'll, I'll just talk about it briefly now um, there's a politics disadvantage that says that if if you uh, kind of lessen intellectual property rights protection there'll be a political backlash to this there's actually some specific evidence that says, this would make it difficult for um, this would make it difficult for like Biden to kind of get the rest of his agenda. And a lot of people kind of read the impact. It just is like you need some Biden needs to get his infrastructure proposal uh, through the Congress. And then they usually say the infrastructure proposal is important to solve climate change or boosting the economy or something like that. So there's a politics disadvantage that the negative can read and has read. Uh, kind of in many in many debates that just kind of says that this would hurt Biden and the idea is that the counter plan would would strengthen Biden because he would originally say yes uh, I mean originally say no and then get ruled against it and kind of be forced into it now <laughs> they don't have any evidence that says that like if he, he would come out stronger if he originally said no and then lost like arguably he might come out weaker um, they don't have any evidence for the first point so it's just kind of a a question of kind of the explanation of that, but like, yeah, I, I think the affirmative could argue this making look even weaker, but anyhow.
there's that. There's also kind of an argument that going through the the World Trade Organization, like kind of having this litigated through the World Trade Organization, would strengthen the dispute settlement mechanism within the World Trade Organization. And that if you had a stronger dispute uh, settlement mechanism and people kind of abided by it more, then China wouldn't really steal as much intellectual property as they do. And then it argues that China intellectual property uh, rights, China intellectual property theft is bad. So um, those are some process counter plans that people have run, you know, the kind of consult, the U.S. refuse, then agree, the like doing something to strengthen the dispute settlement mechanism, consulting the world. Uh, health organization, right? I mean, people want to have like generic counter plans that they can read in any debate. So those are some uh, process counter plans. And like I said, there is an article uh, by a college debate coach who really does not like the consult counter plan um, up on the website. Then, of course, the other thing is there is a, uh, a pick. I haven't really talked about picks, uh, plan inclusive counter plans. I haven't seen more. I'm surprised I haven't seen more of these, uh, but people can definitely argue that. Uh, you know, if, if the affirmative has to defend it all, this is a theory debate, right? But, you know, if the affirmative has to defend like all countries, for example, the negative could say, well, we won't, this country like won't record, limit intellectual property or we won't do it for the, this drug. Uh, there's a team that argues that you shouldn't do this for dual use uh, drugs. So dual use drugs could be a drug that's like, um, you know, kind of can help people's health, but also kind of can kind of help uh maybe uh, confront bioterror, like the impacts to bioterror. Um, and they argue that any drugs that are dual use, uh, we should not limit the patents on those because we need innovation in that area. Um, now, look, this argument, it sounds better than it is. I mean, the, 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 the obvious kind of problem based on what we've already discussed is there's the debate about whether or not the patents actually allow like innovation in that area or not. And then kind of the second, the second major problem is that pretty much every, every drug, right, is every vaccine at least um, is related to, uh, is a little bit dual use, right? Like if there's a bioterror attack, you need a COVID-19 drug. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really know how much this would pick out of, but uh, th there's a potential counter plan there. And then there's the NAP, national health insurance um, counter plan, which I should have mentioned with, uh, with the price controls counter plan because they're similar. But what this counter plan does is this counter plan says that the um, the U.S. should adopt national health insurance. And then, you know, if there was just one provider, right, of, of health insurance and, and th this provider was the government that purchased all the medical supplies and distributed all the uh, medical care, then the, the drug companies you know, would kind of just have to pay what the U.S. government was willing to pay for the drugs. Now, obviously, there would have to be some negotiation, right? Like the companies, the government would have to allow the companies to continue to make some kind of a profit. Otherwise, they, you know, if they could no profit at all on any drugs, then, right, the companies would essentially cease to exist. But the argument is, is that this would like lower the prices. Now, this would just probably lower the prices in the United States. Um, but that is... Uh, you know, that's kind of an argument um, there. Now, the other critiques. Um, so the common critiques, there's capitalism critique that just says, hey, you're just making a minor reform. Uh, you're just making a minor reform in the system, which uh, just kind of props up capitalism, right? Makes, okay, we're gonna have a waiver, especially if it's just like on one drug. We'll have a COVID-19 waiver. This makes these, com you know, these companies will lose some money, but in the end, they come out looking very, very good and they're just able to monopolize all the other medicines and the distribution of all the other medicines and like cause all the other problems uh, that capitalism creates. Uh, there's kind of the libertarianism coercion argument. I mentioned this earlier. It's just like, hey, you shouldn't be able to take my property uh, and give it to somebody else. There is an Afro pessimism argument that says that the, um, you know, minorities are never really basically you know, able to escape racism is just kind of ingrained in our civic institutions. I'm sure you're kind of familiar with this argument. So especially against any case that kind of claims a racism advantage, this is especially effective. You know, some people make the death, good, living, bad argument. Uh, there's arguments about like how we represent the disabled um, in these debates about like, you know, access to drugs and what drugs people need. Uh, so there's, there's critiques to that. And then there's a lot of, there is kind of a lot of like crisis crisis rhetoric related to diseases and like disease securitization. 
um, being bad. So now I'm just going to kind of run through here, um, just kind of quickly some are, and I'll cover these more in other lectures about like how to answer like some of the kind of the main arguments. So like how do you answer the drug distribution and morality? Well, you can say there are status quo efforts, charitable efforts through COVAX uh, that make this possible. Um, there's a big kind of thing that says, even if we kind of give the drugs away, that the, com the countries themselves, a lot, especially the poorest developing countries that have the least amount of access, that the affirmative evidence is talking about, that they don't really have any means to distribute these drugs. Like, right, these drugs have to be kept at like certain temperatures and like, you know, transported in certain ways and distributed in certain ways. And they don't really have the technology or the medical infrastructure to do that. It's a pretty good argument. And that they don't really even have the means to manufacture them, right? Like I talked about the safety argument before that they might manufacture them poorly, but that assumes that like they can manufacture them in the first place. Um, and of course, the innovation turns the argument, right? If the affirmative wins the innovation turn, um, excuse me, if the negative wins the innovation argument, then there are gonna be fewer drugs in the future for other people to access. Um, there's also kind of this issue of fakes and counterfeits, which I probably should have discussed uh, in the content, you know, after I discussed the safety argument, but it's related to the safety argument. It says that, you know, hey, if the, if the, if the com companies decide, hey, there's, or the, the countries decide there's no intellectual property on these drugs anymore, then, what, then what's gonna happen is that other people will say, hey, we have this drug, but it could just be a fake or like a counterfeit drug, which I say produces safety or a backlash. There's an industry backlash argument that says that, I mean, obviously the, the, <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry would really be opposed to this. Uh, and there's an argument that this industry would backlash. Some people make it as a politics argument that they would then kind of go after and undermine the rest of Biden's agenda. But also like there is a kind of a, a solvency term just, just in terms of like uh, the distribution of the drugs. Because right now um, these companies like to a degree, they like are donating drugs. They are making like some price concessions, right? There are US government and other government initiatives to purchase and help distribute the drugs. So it's not that they're not doing anything, but if you removed Right. Maybe some, there's some evidence, too, that says they're helping these countries develop like, you know, uh, distribution lines. And maybe they're also considering entering into co-production agreements with companies in other countries, which would allow them to produce the drugs, not just retain access to the intellectual property. Well, you know, OK, so there's some like progress there. It's slow, admittedly, but there is some progress there. And if you really kind of alienate the companies, then they're not going to help these other uh, these other countries and companies in these other countries develop the drugs. Um, and given that the countries don't really know themselves like how to manufacture or distribute the drugs, if they lose the support of the big companies like Pfizer and that, then they're not going to be able to do anything. So you can kind of put like the combination of the and then, you know, if they don't get support from Pfizer and Moderna, like in regards to like safety issues, then you're going to have safety problems. So you can kind of put this together as kind of like a nice, um, story and then of course you know you want to kind of defend like basically like utilitarianism the greatest good for the greatest number uh as far as like the bioterror arguments um you know that people are making on the pro you can say there's a very low risk of bioterror that if we don't have innovation there's going to be more bioterror uh the terrorists would die like trying to get a hold of uh bioterror materials terror can't terrorists can't get a hold of this material this is like very um these are kind of kind of common, but also somewhat strong answers to the bioterror argument uh, that are in the file. Uh, how do we answer the innovations argument? Um, some of these are already talked through, so I'll go through them briefly. Um, but you know, uh, how do, so this is like the con, right? And the con says innovation uh, argument. Like, how do we answer that? Well, I would say like, look, we already have these drugs. We already have uh, a Pfizer and Moderna drugs, so we need to get them distributed. So at the very least, like, yeah, even if you win like some future innovations argument, you can't turn our COVID advantage. You can say the second thing is that the governments is really good evidence that basically the major innovations um, in drug development have been funded by the government through grants that they gave to the companies. And then the companies still end up with like uh, getting their own intellectual uh, property, but that the governments are really like funding this. I mean, the US government put billion, gave these companies billions of dollars uh, to develop these COVID drugs. You could also say that they're, they, you know, they don't need to make such a great profit. They don't need to profit on every drug. Like I said, some drugs don't even make it to market. So, okay, they don't like patent, they don't, they don't make money on a COVID vaccine. Okay. So like, you know, it's not probably going to destroy the company. Now, obviously like 
if the waiver is on all drugs, <laughs> okay, then they are going to lose like all of their profits. But okay, some people say they would innovate more if they had lower profits. Now that again assumes that they have any profits. If you waive all the intellectual property rights, then you're totally dependent on the government. Some people say they could cut back on advertising. Again, assumes that they still kind of exist. Um, some people say that other countries are going to innovate. That, uh, that's true. It's just that the U.S. is like the world leader in innovation and does develop most of the drugs. Um, some people kind of make a, uh, a lobbying turn that these companies wouldn't waste so much money lobbying. Again, it assumes that they continue to exist. Then the evergreen argument that I talked about, the lawsuit fears arguments that I talked about. Again, I think the big thing for the con is they really kind of just need to figure out like what the, the pro, the affirmative is advocating for, right? They're advocating for a limiting intellectual property on like all drugs. <laughs> These companies like have no, basically no way to make money. Um, so they're going to kind of go away, right? So that's like, you know, so if you're a company, you know, like well, how is the world like better off? Like the world, the world in which like there's evergreening and like, lawsuits and like stuff like that. Sure, that, you know, pat monopolies, um, you know, maybe there's some excess profits, uh, the company should be reinvesting, but all those things could arguably slow down drug development. But like, if all those things like, but if, if the alternative is companies can't profit at all on drugs, then there, there aren't gonna be drugs, right? Like no one's gonna run a company in which you agree not to make a profit, like people who run major companies could run other companies. <laughs> right? They'll just go work in another field and investors will just put their money in other places. So I think these turns are kind of helpful, but it, you know, they're more helpful if the, the affirmative is just advocating for a waiver on like a COVID-19 drug um, than if they're advocating kind of for a waiver like on all medicines. That just basically, I, the, you can talk, you can, you can read any turn you want, but in the end, these companies are just gonna, are just gonna kind of go out of, go out of business. Um, how do you answer the economy argument the econ might make? You can say, well, diseases, especially mutations, kill the economy. Um, you, can, you can use your innovation turns. You can say too much of a focus on profit means inequality, disease, war, death. Uh, there's some arguments about why, you know, in particular, in particularly on the dollar argument, there's, there's some arguments about why too much control of the uh, dollar or why U.S. dollar dominance is bad. It allows the U.S. to enforce sanctions, right? Because trade basically occurs like on, on the dollar currency and that sanctions are bad. So you can impact turn some of those arguments. How do you answer the property rights arguments? Uh, the, you can argue that the, uh, um, you know, protection of this intellectual property is actually killing people worldwide. Uh, you can argue that uh, property um, really shouldn't protect intellectual property because, um, well, you, you can make two arguments. A, property itself is often hereditary, right? So it's kind of based it's kind of based on kind of inequality generally and kind of arguably racism uh, generally. As I said, there's kind of a disproportionate um, whites own a disproportionate amount of the property, um, and then that's kind of passed on. So it's arguably a bit racist. Intellectual property, in particular, can really kind of depend on like how smart you are, which you don't have any. Uh, control over that's kind of like what, what you're born with so there's a little bit of luck and then you can just kind of make a case for uh, distributional ethics like distributing property um, so that kind of really covers kind of like you know not everything I'm sure you'll come across some other arguments uh, that people are making hopefully you will especially since it's just the beginning of September hopefully people will innovate and come up with some additional ideas but um, that covers a lot of the arguments all these arguments um, there's evidence for all these arguments um, on the Debate Us website, which you can subscribe to as a student for only $29.99 a year or for $249 if you're a coach. But if you're a coach, you can activate 100 of your students. It gives you access to not only the Lincoln Douglas materials, but all the materials on the website, which you might find helpful uh, debating these topics. And we're unlike other uh, companies, we're constantly like revising and improving the evidence and the arguments. Um, as we go. So it's not just a one and done. It, it gives you access for the entire year. So hopefully you found the lecture useful and hopefully you'll consider subscribing.